Hello! In today's session, we'll be talking about different properties of light and so forth to set the stage for our later conversations on visual perception. The topics that we'll talk about include our heart-to-heart -heart talk on the facts of light, another heart-to-heart -heart talk on the birds and the bees. We'll also talk about a demo that we'll do in class, a demo that we call smoked filters. And then finally, we'll have some conversation about the human eye and physiological optics. So let's jump right in and begin talking about the facts of light. As we can see here, and as I, you have on your notes, light is one type of electromagnetic energy, or EM, that humans can typically see. And we can see a range of light that is expressed in nanometers. That range would be approximately 400 nanometers to approximately 700 nanometers. Just to remind ourselves, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter, and that would be 1 times 10 to the negative 9. So if you can imagine that we can see particular wavelengths of light, and a wavelength will be defined as a complete iteration of a pattern, and that pattern will be occurring over maybe 400 to maybe 700 nanometers. That's the range over which most humans can see, and this is true also of most of our nearest genetic neighbors. Maybe some of the old world monkeys and some of the new world monkeys typically see in this range as well. Light has both wave-like properties and particle-like properties, and we'll discuss each of those in turn. We'll begin by talking a little bit about the wave-like properties that light has. And in class, we'll do a demo that we'll call the wave, and this is very much like the wave that you would see in an athletic stadium. You might know that in an athletic stadium, we have a particular person perhaps stand up and sit down, so that person is moving vertically. The person next to them stands up and sits down, the person next to them stands up and sits down, and so forth, and we get this traveling disturbance. What I hope you will note down on your paper is that we can define a wave, any wave, as a traveling disturbance. And there are different kinds of traveling disturbances, different kinds of waves. Light tends to be a transverse wave. And we can define a transverse wave as a wave in which oscillations are perpendicular, and that's the critical word here, perpendicular to the direction the wave travels. Again, going back to our stadium wave, we can have the first person stand up and sit down, second person stands up and sits down. What's going on here is that there's some local motion that is moving along the y-axis or the vertical axis. By contrast, what's going on at a global level is that the wave is propagating from left to right. So one person stands up, sits down, the next person does that, and overall the wave is traveling along the horizontal axis, even though the local motion is perpendicular to that, it's moving along the vertical axis. So we call this kind of a formation a transverse wave, and all electromagnetic energy is a transverse wave, or travels in accordance with a transverse wave. We can do a different kind of demo, and we will in class, and in this particular case, we'll say that this is the other wave. We'll call it the geek style or longitudinal wave. Here, what we'll do in class is we'll have students hold their hands out like this. And when I say go, I'll ask a student to move their hand into their neighbor's hands. Their neighbor will receive that contact and move into their neighbor's hand and so forth. But now what's going on is that each person locally is moving from left to right as the wave itself on a global level propagates from left to right. So in this particular case, we have a longitudinal wave, a wave in which the oscillations are, and here's the critical bit, parallel to the direction the wave travels. So the local motion might be left-right or horizontal, and the global motion is that as well. What's interesting about this is that all acoustic energy moves in accordance with a longitudinal wave. So as you're looking at this video and you're taking it all in, my voice is coming to you by way of acoustic energy that is moving longitudinally or moving in accordance with a longitudinal wave. By contrast, the sights that you're getting from this video are coming to you through electromagnetic energy, and those are coming to you by way of a transverse wave. So we have these two different kinds of waves that we'll be talking about throughout the semester, but it was important to introduce it here to set the stage for understanding the visual sense. We'll now move on and we'll consider the particle-like properties that light has. We've talked a little bit about the wave-like properties. Now we'll move to its particle components. The smallest particle or unit of light is the photon. And not all photons are equal in this way. And we'll see if we can understand why. Some photons 
oscillate as they move, for example, from the sun out toward us. They oscillate as they move along that distance at relatively high rates. These are said to be of high energy. So here's an example visually of a relatively fast oscillating photon. Move something like this. Okay. We can have a slower oscillating photon that might move something like this. Importantly, it's moving left to right at the same rate, but the number of oscillations that we have across a unit of space would either be relatively high or relatively low. If we have high energy photons, we can say that they're traveling a short distance over the course of each oscillation, so they have short wavelengths. Okay? We can think of the wavelength as the distance that this oscillation is occurring over, and that might be relatively small or relatively larger. The short wave or high energy light or high energy photons typically appear bluish to us from a psychological perspective. So today we're introducing this topic by discussing a little bit of the physics and we've talked before about psychophysics but we also want to be able to tie this back to our psychological experiences. So the photons that we see in the range from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers those will tend to look bluish when they're closer to the 400 nanometer side of the spectrum. Right? This background that you're getting here hopefully is coming across on the video as a nice looking blue. By contrast, we can change the background and get more of a reddish color and we can say that some photons oscillate at relatively low rates. These are said to be lower in energy and low energy photons travel a comparatively long distance over the course of each oscillation so they have long wavelengths. This would be closer to the 700 nanometer end of our spectrum. Long wave low energy light typically appears reddish to most humans. So hopefully you're getting a really nice red background here that we can contrast with the blue background that we were getting just a moment ago. We'll also remind ourselves of the very famous experiments that most of you know about by Sir Isaac Newton. He took a prism and divided what we might somewhat crudely call white light or broadband light into different components where we got different wavelengths of light coming to different regions of space and he saw this full spectrum. Many of you know this as Roy G. Biv, the initials that we might use to spell out the various colors of the spectrum. The important point that he was making is that this quote-unquote white light really isn't white and in fact the rays are not colored at all. All we have out here in the electromagnetic spectrum is different wavelengths of light and you and I psychologically experience these as different colors. As one of the persons on my doctoral committee, Billy Wooten, mentioned, the red's in the head. I don't know that Billy Wooten is the first person to make this quip, but he's the first person that I heard make the quip, so I'm going to give credit to this particular line, the red's in the head, to Billy Wooten. So here we have this nice red background, and it always astonishes me that I perceive this so saliently as red, but there's nothing red physically about it. It's just relatively long wave light, something closer to the 700 nanometer end of the spectrum. Okay, we can talk about why it's advantageous from an evolutionary standpoint to be able to distinguish, for example, this blue background from this red background, or even two different shades of red, one from the next. One reason might be that you can imagine that as our ancestors were evolving on the plains of the Serengeti, perhaps, there were lots of different berries that would have been available to us. And the berries might have been slightly different in color psychologically, which is to say that they have correspondingly relatively longer or relatively shorter wavelengths. To the extent that an organism can make a wavelength discrimination, maybe even a subtle wavelength discrimination, by saying something like, that's one shade of red, that's a slightly different shade of red, they might be able to figure out with some experience or by learning from their parents or other members of their group, that this particular shade of red is a poisonous berry and this slightly different shade of red is a very nutritious berry. Anybody who can make that distinction has an evolutionary advantage. What we have in this slide is a list from the researcher Terry Sanofsky of four F's of evolutionary survival. And we'll go through those F's. I'll ask you to say the F's with me. The first F is fighting. The next is fleeing. The next is feeding. And the last F is reproduction. So these are the four F's of evolutionary survival according to Terry Sanofsky. And what we're going to do on our next few slides is try to understand how it is that electromagnetic energy in general and the portion that we can see, we sometimes call that the light portion, although strictly speaking, all EM is a form of light. 
We'll see how light might help us with these various components of evolutionary survival. So let's talk about the evolutionary advantages of being sensitive to any form of EM, or electromagnetic energy, versus being sensitive to some other form of energy, for example, acoustic energy. Okay. So let's take a look at what the general advantages are of sensitivity to EM. Electromagnetic energy travels quickly, thereby conveying almost immediate information about very distant objects, which might include food or predators, potential mates, other things that might be evolutionarily relevant to us. Some of you might know about the speed of light. There are a couple of ways of expressing it. We can express the speed of light with respect to the English system or with respect to the metric system. In the English system, we can say that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. That's not miles per hour, but that's miles per second. In the metric system, we can express the speed of light as 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That would be 300 million meters per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second, if you like to think of it that way. So this is something that's traveling, not instantaneously, but at a very, very high rate. And it's giving us information very quickly about distant objects, some of which are evolutionarily relevant. So it would be, in some way, more advantageous to be sensitive to EM as a messenger, rather than to acoustic energy as a messenger, because of how fast this particular form of energy travels. We can also say that electromagnetic energy tends to move in straight lines. And what's important about that is it preserves information about the shape of objects or food, predators, or potential mates. So that's neat. Not only is it the case that we're getting information very quickly, but we're also getting information that is preserving shapes of objects out there in the real world. As we'll get into later on in this discussion, light will eventually bend when it is refracted by some kind of object but through most of its traverse, it's moving in straight lines, and that preserves shape information for us. So we get distant information and accurate information about objects very, very quickly. We can also zoom in just a little bit more and say, why might it be evolutionarily advantageous to not only be sensitive to EM in general, but more specifically to the range that we're calling light, 400 to 700 nanometers, the range that most humans can see. A couple of advantages here also. Light is bouncy. This region of the spectrum, from 400 to 700 nanometers, is, to use an informal phrase, bouncy. What we mean like that is, unlike longer wave energy, which passes through many opaque objects, light can be reflected. It bounces off of objects, making them visible. So in this way, light, or the 400 to 700 range of the EM spectrum, is a really effective messenger. If we think instead about some longer wavelength radiation, uh, maybe like in your microwave oven, or on your cell phone, or radio waves, or the kind of wave that you might have in your car's remote operating device when you can unlock or lock your car from a distance. All of those are taking advantage of the EM spectrum also. But that particular wavelength is such that it will pass right through objects. And that can be a nice property to have. But it's also nice to have sensitivity to some form of the EM spectrum that bounces off of things so that we can see what's out there in the distance. We get information about the distal stimulus when we have sensitivity to, if you will, to be informal, the bouncy portions of the EM spectrum. On our planet, light is also plentiful. By contrast, short wave energy tends to be absorbed by our atmosphere, by oxygen and nitrogen, and is less plentiful. So the region of the spectrum that you and I can see, 400 to 700, is really quite plentiful, particularly for terrestrial animals like us, and also for some aquatic animals that might be in the ocean, but maybe not so deeply into the ocean. You might know that as you move further and further into the ocean, it's harder and harder for light to penetrate through the water, and we tend to lose the reds first, and we tend to have maybe just the blues all the way down there, the higher energy photons will make it. But for us terrestrial animals, it's nice that we have such plentiful light. So we can summarize some of those advantages from an evolutionary perspective in the following way. It's really an effective messenger because it's plenty fast, it's plenty straight, it's plenty bouncy, and frankly, it's plenty plenty. Just plain old plenty. <clears throat> so we can talk about the evolutionary advantages of using light, and we can say that the eyes have it. 
That is to say, the eyes have the advantage of being sensitive to this highly effective messenger of what's out there in the real world. And some eyes have this sensitivity even more so than others. And that brings us to our section on the birds and the bees. So before we begin our heart-to-heart -heart talk on the birds and the bees, what we'll do is ask you to stop the video and make some questions or note down some comments that you might have, something that you might like to share or clarify in class.